It was no secret that powerful Western business interests exploited Japan's eagerness to modernize and her thirst for conquest to attack Tsarist Russia. Political cartoons of the day attest to this. Jacob Schiff even bragged about it. John Hammond was quoted in the New York Times commenting on Schiff's boastful statement that the money of Jewish bankers had made it possible for Japan to wage a successful war against Russia. George Kennan boasted about his role in taking down the Tsar as well. He arrived in Japan in 1904, just as the war was getting underway, and with the permission of the Meiji government, distributed anti-Tsarist propaganda to Russian prisoners of war. He was later quoted as saying that, as a result, 50,000 Russian officers and men went back to their country ardent revolutionists. Yet another straw was laid across the Tsar's back. In 1908, Jacob Schiff led a campaign to force then-President Taft to abrogate the U.S.'s long-standing trade agreement with Russia. Skeptics often submit that Jacob Schiff's campaign to topple the Tsar was merely a private crusade, but this is clearly not the case. In 1915, the American International Corporation was formed. On its board of directors sat some of the top financiers of the day, Percy Rockefeller, his brother-in-law James A. Stillman, and the president of E.H. Harriman's Southern and Union Pacific Railroads, Robert S. Lovett, all directors at National City Bank of New York. The company's founder was National City Bank's president, Frank Vanderlip, one of the seven attendees at Jekyll Island. Other AIC directors included Otto Kahn of Kuhn and Loeb, Pierre Dupont, and the great-grandfather of George W. Bush, George Herbert Walker. The American International Corporation worked closely with another important company, Guarantee Trust of New York. Guarantee Trust had been built up on the Rockefeller, Whitney, Vanderbilt, and Harriman fortunes, but by 1915, J.P. Morgan held controlling interest. Guarantee Trust's list of directors was impressive as well. It included George F. Baker, Charles H. Allen, Rothschild Representative August Belmont, Harry Payne Whitney, and J.P. Morgan partner Thomas Lamont. The bank's vice president was Harold Stanley, who would go on to co-found the Morgan Stanley Investment House. In short, the bulk of American wealth and power was represented on the boards of these two companies. Together, they would eventually control dozens of multinational corporations operating around the globe. But in 1915, their first order of business was to pick up where Jacob Schiff left off and, in the final years leading up to the Russian Revolution, see to it that Lenin and Trotsky's Bolsheviks had all the backing they needed. Finally, in 1917, Tsar Nicholas II, weakened by George Kennan's propaganda campaign, humiliating defeat at the hands of the Japanese, and catastrophic involvement in World War I, fell to the Bolsheviks. The Tsar and his family were killed in a house in Yekaterinburg. Communism was born. How surprising that the second architect of the Defense Act of 1947 turns out to be George Kennan's cousin, twice removed, George F. Kennan. If you are confused by the fact that the CIA and their arch-nemesis, Communist Russia, were created essentially by the same people, don't be. The Central Intelligence Agency was never designed to fight the spread of communism, safeguard democracy, or anything like that, despite the fact that the communist threat provided the justification for practically everything the agency did up until the fall of the Soviet Union. In truth, the CIA was created to do a very simple, specific job, a job to which intelligence gathering is merely incidental. Now, before introducing the third architect of the Defense Act of 1947, we really need to answer a few questions, which are undoubtedly nagging at you by now. What is it that the CIA was really designed to do? What is the real agenda of the bankers and organizations like the CFR? And what did Ford Foundation President Rowan Gaither mean when he said, as quoted by Norman Dodd, We shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that it can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. And finally, who are these people? Is there a so-called Jewish conspiracy, as some conspiracy theorists claim? And what about that other group often accused of trying to run the world, the Freemasons? Do they play a role in any of this? We can answer all of these questions, and more. But there's a little more digging we'll have to do first, so grab your shovel. When Tokugawa Ieyasu granted exclusive trading privileges to the Dutch, he wasn't forming an alliance so much with Holland as with the Dutch East India Company, which set up their first trading outpost in Asia just after Ieyasu's victory at Sekigahara. The Dutch East India Company and its main competitor, the British East India Company, were the first multinational corporations. 
they wielded the power of sovereign nations on the seas and generated tremendous profits plundering the far corners of the world. When people think of these outfits, they think of spices, and while it is true that the Dutch and British East India companies imported spices and tea from the east to the west, the most lucrative part of their business was the opium trade. A Dutch West India trading company was also formed to profit from the lucrative slave trade in the Americas. To put it bluntly, much of what these trading companies engaged in was licensed piracy. Another interesting fact about these trading companies is that they were dominated by Freemasons, from the investors and governors down to the ship's captains. This is evident in the numerous Masonic lodges which sprung up along the trade routes. So how curious that both pirates and Freemasons are associated with this symbol. The skull and crossbones is a prominent symbol in masonry. Here are some Freemasonic aprons. A skull and usually crossbones are also present in what is called the Chamber of Reflection, a room prepared for initiates undergoing the Masonic rite of the first degree in many orders. What few people know is that both Freemasons and pirates inherited the symbol from the same place, the Knights Templar. The true origin of the skull and crossbones is most likely the Chi Ro, an ancient symbol whose meaning is not morbid at all, but more akin to rebirth. The first Templar to fly the skull and crossbones, legend has it, was Roger II of Sicily, who harassed and plundered the coasts of Greece and northern Africa, and for whom the Jolly Roger is named. According to myth, Roger's father, King Roger I, copulated with the corpse of his wife Adelaide, Roger II's dead mother and returned nine months later to find only a skull and crossbones. The original Templars were Normans, the blood product of Franks and Vikings. The order was formed during the First Crusade, and with special privileges granted by the Pope, they amassed great wealth and power, operated a vast banking network, and built hundreds of churches and castles across Europe and the Middle East. They also maintained a large fleet of ships, and dominated the commerce of much of the world. The Templar Knights had a good run until 1307, when King Philip IV of France, who was deeply in debt to the order, lit on the idea of wiping out his debts by charging the Templars with heresy. And so, with the consent of the Pope, his men began arresting knights. Many were imprisoned and tortured, and some burned at the stake. Most, however, fled, mainly to Portugal and Spain, Scotland, and very likely Switzerland. How interesting that the home of the Bank for International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks, may well have been a refuge of these medieval bankers. Author Ernesto Freire explored what happened to the Templar fleet, which disappeared from the shores of La Rochelle when the hammer of King Philip came down. He concludes, like others, that many Templars took to the sea after the banishment, thereafter adopting a life of piracy. These skull and bones decorate gravestones in a churchyard in Temple Midlothian, an area granted to the Templars by David I of Scotland in the 12th century. Scotland is rich in Templar history, and some believe that the Knights helped Robert the Bruce win independence from England on the field of Bannockburn. So what do you think? Does the flag of Scotland really derive from the cross of St. Andrew, as legend has it? Or maybe from this? Author John J. Robinson explored what became of the Knights Templar in Britain after their banishment. Robinson makes a strong case that the Templars simply went underground and evolved into what would emerge centuries later as Freemasonry. Robinson is not alone in observing many connections between the two orders. Various Masonic rites belied Templar origins, and the Temple of Solomon, which served as the Templars' headquarters in Jerusalem, is a central feature of Freemasonry. Maybe the best clue that Crusader Knights gave rise to Freemasonry is that Andrew Michael Ramsey, a prominent Scottish Freemason during the 18th century, said so in a speech given at a French lodge. There was already a large Templar presence in Portugal and Spain when those fleeing from France arrived. There, the Templar Knights simply adopted different names. In Castile and Aragon, they joined existing orders, such as the Order of Santiago. In Portugal, a new order was formed, the Knights of Christ. The heirs of these repackaged Templar Knights, who were expert mariners, contributed greatly to the dominance of Portugal and Spain during the era of world exploration. Henry the Navigator was in fact a Grand Master of the Knights of Christ, and Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and Ferdinand Magellan were all associated with these orders and flew the Templar Red Cross on their ships.